I'm doing is legal. This is why I believe I'll receive justice in the Howard Court. More to right, and right center than the left. Oh, it is gone! He did it! He did it! It doesn't matter what your background is and where you come from. If you have dreams and you have goals, and that's all that really matters. But there's only one you say, Bolt. I owe you know a lot to Charlie. The freedom of expression that the entire world could see. Our world could see. When you black, it's not a movement. It's a lifestyle. This is who we are. Two minutes and four seconds. In the battle of good versus evil, that's all it took. Caught on the ropes under a barrage of body punches. Max Smelling, Nazi Germany's reluctant symbol of Aryan superiority, had the wind sucked right out of him. As he tried to weave, he was struck in the kidney. But he knew that night in New York Yankee Stadium that Joe Lewis was just too young, too fit, and too fast, too good. In the world of 1938, on the brink of war, everything was seen in black and white. So 22-year-old Lewis handed the USA and its allies a symbolic victory over Adolf Hitler. Although that's not why the fight is now regarded as perhaps the most significant bout in history. It's because it marked the first time white America was cheering for the black guy against the white guy. Joseph Lewis Barrow was the seventh of eight children born in Chambers County, rural Alabama. To sharecroppers, Monroe and Lily Barrow. He knew little of his father, who was committed to a mental asylum when Joe was two. His mother remarried, and when Joe was 12, the family moved to Detroit, where several members worked at the Ford Motor Plant. A speech impediment meant he spoke little as a child. Shy and gentle, he sought to avoid the gangs of his tough new neighborhood and learned to box at the local youth club. His mother preferred him to learn the violin, and legend has it, Joe would carry his boxing gloves in his violin case so his mom wouldn't find out. That's also why he never used his full name when he started fighting. Joseph Lewis Barrow signed up as Joe Lewis quickly impressing as a member of the Chicago Golden Gloves team. He turned pro at 20 and quickly strung together 19 wins before his big break, a fight against former world champion Primo Carnera. Primo Carnera, former heavyweight champion of the world, is feeling as fit as two fiddles, training to the last ounce. And that is work when you think of the number of ounces Carnera's got. He's to fight Joe Lewis, the colored sensation who packs dynamite in both gloves and thinks Carnera is just a big baby. That's Lewis in white. He's won 19 fights in a row. Lewis downed Carnera in six, and then downed another former world champion, Max Baer, in four. On the horizon was the reigning world champ, the Cinderella man, James J. Braddock. Joe Lewis was on the way to building his own fairy tale. But in the fight game, things are never that simple. The Joe Lewis Max Smelling fight of 1938 may have been the precursor to World War II, 
But two years earlier, their first meeting was intended by the Lewis camp to be simply the precursor to a title fight with world champion James J. Braddock. Young, exciting Joe was expected to beat Smelling easily. The German had been considered lucky to win the heavyweight belt in 1930 when Jack Sharkey was disqualified and he lost the rematch. He'd also since been beaten by Max Baer, who Lewis had beaten easily. Lewis was already in talks with Braddock for a title fight once he had dispatched the German. Hey, Joe, I may be having a fun with you sometime this summer or fall, maybe in September, October. OK by me. Trouble was, it wasn't OK by Max. He'd examined footage of the young American and had a plan and changed his normal style to suit. Lewis was sent to the canvas for the first time in his career in the fourth round. Couldn't recover and was knocked out in the 12th, prompting this report in the language of the times. Now, ladies and gentlemen, meet the mitts that meant to battle their way to the world title. Only something went wrong and they didn't. Meet the owner, 14 stone, two pounds of colored dynamite that didn't explode. In other words, Joe Lewis. He's got a lightning left, but there was no thunder from his corner when he met Max Schmeling, 31-year-old ex-champion from Germany. Everyone thought he'd be just a Roman holiday for the Brown Bomber, and everyone got the surprise of their lives, and so did Lewis. In fact, the only man who wasn't surprised was Schmeling himself. Really sure I can beat him. You said it, Max. Max, what was the punch with which you knocked out Joe Lewis? You want me to show you? Yes, try it. Oh, boy, <laughs> that's great. Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party embraced Smelling after the victory and made him a reluctant tool of their propaganda. He had expected to get a title shot against the champion Braddock, but with relations between Germany and the U.S. deteriorating, it never happened. Instead, it was Lewis bouncing back from his first defeat with seven rapid-fire wins in just eight months, who signed to fight for the title in 1937. More than 40,000 fight fans crowded into Kaminsky Park to see Joe Lewis knock out Jim Braddock. But the excitement in the fight arena was nothing compared to the whoopee in Harlem when the Brown Bomber floored his man in the eighth round to become the first colored heavyweight champion of the world since the days of Jack Johnson. Joe won his title by magnificent fighting, the best by far of his career. As for Bretta, he can always be proud of the fight he fought, game and battling right to the end. Those cheers for Lewis and Harlem were replicated around the nation, where Jack Johnson's reign between 1908 and 1915 had highlighted the racial problems in the U.S., Joe was not as divisive a personality. His handlers work hard on his media image from the start, giving him a number of guidelines, including never have his picture taken with a white woman, never gloat over a fallen opponent, live clean and fight clean. It helped that at his core, Joe was a decent man. When he beat Braddock for the world title, he felt he owed Max Smelling a crack at the belt, declaring, I don't want to be called champ until I whip Max Smelling. By 1938, Germany and the US had only contempt for each other. So avoiding the man who had beaten him would have been easy. But Smelling had fought a lot in the U.S., and he, too, was a decent man. The two fighters actually liked each other. So Joe gave him a shot, June 22, 1938. 
Smelling faced protests when he arrived in the U.S. and endured terrible insults and abuse in the lead up to the fight. When the German was down three times in the first round, all of America rejoiced. Years later, his son, Joe Lewis Jr., summed up the symbolism pretty good. What my father did was enable white America to think of him as an American, not as a black. By winning, he became white America's first black hero. The way the two nations treated their two fighters later was in contrast. As the Patriot champion, Lewis racked up 15 title defenses in three years and became even more loved when he signed up to fight under new management, Uncle Sam. He was dubbed the Brown Bomber, perhaps questionable, but affectionately meant. And for the duration of the war, he was a morale booster, giving more than 100 exhibition fights for the troops. Staff Sergeant Joseph Lewis Barrow visits London. In other words, Joe Lewis, world heavyweight champion, comes to town. He's in the army, all right, but one of his jobs is to give exhibition bouts for the entertainment of the troops. Apparently, he won't be doing any serious boxing till after the war, when no doubt he'll be challenged for the title he's held so long and with such distinction. As for Smelling, after his defeat, Hitler no longer wanted to be photographed with him. That suited Max, who was ashamed of his nation's treatment of Jews, even hiding several children in his apartment during a purge and refusing to dump his longtime Jewish manager. So the Nazis drafted him to the war and sent him to the front line. He was wounded in the Battle of Crete in 1941. Broke, he made a comeback in 1947 at the age of 42. And it was only when Germany opened up again in the 50s that his old US friendships secured him a position with Coca-Cola in Germany. After the war, Lewis also continued fighting and between defenses, staged a string of exhibitions. He stretched his number of successful title defenses to 25, a feat still unmatched by any other fighter in any weight division. But he was getting older, slowing down. It was only a matter of time before the good times stopped rolling. Joe Lewis won his first two title defenses after World War II, like the good old days, by knockout. Of his then 23 defenses, only two had gone the distance. But coming up against the wily Jersey Joe Walcott, it was about to get harder. Joe Lewis, world heavyweight champion, put in his final training at Pompton Lakes, New Jersey, before defending his title for the 24th occasion. He's reported as saying that the contender was second rate, and he was confident of finishing him off in quick time. What, how many exhibitions have there, Joe? I had, I did 94 rounds of boxing over there. Gee, that's, sounds like you were in training right there. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> it was a lot of rounds. Yes, it was. It looked like you're trying to sneak up on me. <laughs> the first Walcott fight went to Lewis on split decision. He won the rematch by knockout in 11. Title defense number 25. But it was clear at 34 that he was far from the fighter of the pre-war era. So he decided to retire to the golf course. You think anybody could talk you into fighting again with a big purse possibly <laughs> running like that? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think I'm all through. So a great champion retires from the ring. Lewis was a fine golfer. His famed generosity helped the careers of several black golfers, including Charlie Shifford, 
and Ted Rhodes in their struggle to break the sport's color barrier. But his generosity and trust was about to backfire big time. It's estimated that over the years, Lewis received less than 20% of his earnings, the rest going to his handlers. His tax accounts were audited, and Joe had to fight exhibitions to earn a living. But that wasn't enough when almost two years after his retirement, the IRS assessed his debt at half a million dollars. He had to fight again. I've been coming down here since 1935 for all of my fights. So I'm back down here again to condition myself for Elsa Charles' fight. Uh, the fight will be sometime in September, and I think I got a very bad chance of winning to back the heavyweight championship of the world. The new champion was Ezzard Charles, lighter, younger, faster than the 36-year-old ex-champ. Lewis went the distance, but Charles won easily on points. Even worse, a poor crowd meant the purse was poor, and Joe had to keep fighting. He fought eight more times in 10 months. Each time, his earnings went straight to Uncle Sam who he had served so well in the time of war. It was shameful. Finally, he was given one last big payday, $300,000. But to earn it, he had to fight the unbeaten and unbeatable Rocky Marciano. Marciano didn't want to fight him, didn't want to hurt him, but knew he needed the money. So he did, knocking him through the ropes and out of the ring in the eighth round. Marciano came to his dressing room later to apologize. Fighting for so long slowed Lewis down, and even with the last payday, the tax bill was still accruing interest. For almost 20 years, the IRS kept him poor. A friend gave him a job greeting tourists at Caesar's Palace in Las Vegas. Another signed him up as a pro wrestler. It was all so sad and tacky. Among those who gave him financial support as his health failed was a now successful German businessman, Max Smith. And when America's hero died at 66, in 1981, Smelling paid for the funeral and flew back over to carry him to rest. It wasn't just the who's who of boxing who paid their tributes. All America mourned his passing. Joe Lewis was born with goodness in his heart and steel in his fist. The facts, a record 12 years as champion, a record 25 title defenses, victories over 10 other champions, all say that he was among the very best of all time. His story, though sad in parts, was rich in triumph and raw in emotion. In an era of turbulence and strife, when his nation needed a hero, Joe Lewis convinced America that not everything should be seen as black or white. Mariano Rivera is the greatest relief pitcher in Major League Baseball history. Rivera spent his entire 19-season career with the New York Yankees, 17 of them as the closer, charged with ensuring his team held on to late leads. He did that a record 652 times and holds a career-earned run average of 2.21, the best in the modern live ball era. 
He's a 13-time All-Star and five-time World Series winner, named MVP of the Fall Classic in 1999. But his best achievement came in 2019, when he became the first player ever to be unanimously elected to the Hall of Fame. It's easy to see the similarities between Joe Lewis and Lionel Rose, the first indigenous Australian to win a boxing world title. Rose was a bantamweight who shot to fame in Australia in the 1960s. Like Lewis, he easily connected with fans because of his fluid movement, good nature, and modesty. Like Lewis, he fought too long lived hard, died too soon. But mainly, like Lewis, his world title did much to improve the racial divisions within his homeland. Indigenous Australians were not even given the right to vote until the 1960s. But by the end of that decade, Rose was the first Aboriginal to be named Australian of the Year and he had the number two selling record on the local pop charts. Raised in poverty in country Victoria, the son of a tent and show boxer, he had his first pro fight at 16. By 19, he was the Australian bantamweight champion. Rose stalked Gatamari all the way, then with a lightning right, knocked him down in the 13th round. This title defense against the more experienced Rocky Gatelleri set up his world championship challenge. He was still a teenager when he headed to Tokyo to fight Japan's Masahito Harada, known as Fighting Harada, and still considered by many to be pound for pound the greatest Japanese boxer ever. After briefly flooring Harada, Rose won a unanimous points decision and returned to a parade through Melbourne streets. He became not merely a hero to Australia's indigenous community, but his win was an important early step in the reconciliation process between white and First Nations people, which even today remains uncompleted. He defended his title six times in the U.S. and Japan, but by the time he turned 21, his best days were behind him. There were too many distractions, too many invitations, and requests he couldn't say no to. He lost his title to Ruben Olivares, and increasing weight saw him step up to featherweight, where they hit harder. Down he goes for a second time, and the end is near. He stepped up further to lightweight, but when that didn't work either, he retired, only to come back after a four-year absence. Do you still like boxing, to be actively involved in it once more? Yes, yes, it's a sport that, uh, you know, as I said, it's hard to get out of your system once you've been in it. Rose lost four of his last five fights, a shadow of his brilliant youth. He was implored to cut down on tobacco and alcohol. But though he couldn't do it, everyone loved him still. He suffered a heart attack at 39, had two more than a stroke at 59, and died four years later. Others may have set better life examples for indigenous Australians, but Lionel Rose was one of the first to win widespread stardom. 